Thank you very much indeed. Um, we are now going to shift from the focus on hydrogen, which is one of those tantalising prospects for how we make a green economy run. I don't think we should be alarmed. I think it still is a test. Maybe it goes a number of times. No one's looking concerned at the back. I think I will keep going. So as we transition from focusing on hydrogen, we are now going to move back up to that bigger picture. So I said at the beginning... Thank you, Roger. <laughs> right, OK. As I said at the beginning of today's conversation, we are at, we are at such a crossroads. In front of us is the prospect of a different operating model, a model that works for people, for the planet, that is zero carbon, and it's much, much needed because the current model is out of road, as we heard from our keynote speaker. So if we're going to make that transition, if we're going to deliver that deep transformation, does that mean sacrifice or does it mean opportunity? Dun, dun, dun. Well, this is what we're going to discover when I invite my four panellists to come on stage. And I know at least one of them is here because I saw him earlier, fresh off the train from Glasgow. So if I could ask to come up to join me, Danny Shrikskanda Raja from Oxfam. There you are, marvellous. Um, Dimitri Zengalis, um, Special Advisor, Bennett Institute, University of Cambridge. Oh, hello. Hi, <laughs> just, just so exciting. I'm still getting used to people being beside me rather than on a camera. A bit overexcited about that. Uh, Rachel Everard, Head of Sustainability of Rolls-Royce. Hello, hello, hello. I think you're fresh from Glasgow too. And then, last but not least, Pierre Paslia, co-CEO, not Pla. Hello. Thank you. God, we're smooth this morning, aren't we? Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, so we don't have a fire alarm at the end of our session, so we don't need to worry about that too much. Um, but we do have very strict timing, so we have to finish at 10.30 to allow these good people to have a cup of coffee. So, deep transformation, just transition to net zero, sacrifice or opportunity, and I have a question for each of you with a slightly different lens, if I may. And I'd like to start with you, Dimitri, first, which is taking the view of the economy, so taking that macroeconomic view, are we talking about sacrifice or opportunity? So one of the really important innovations that happened both at the sort of the high-level negotiations but also kind of, you know, from the bottom up over the last decade is the shift in expectations, sorry, the shift in expectations uh, that this is about burden sharing, sacrificing, rolling our sleeves up for future generations and all the rest of it, to one uh, that says actually this is about self-interest and opportunity, and actually quite near-term opportunity. You know, if you can um, profit by manufacturing and fabricating and exporting new kit in the fastest growing markets, why not? If you can clean up your cities and make them more livable, reduce congestion, reduce particulate pollution, improve mental and physical health, why not? If you can run your systems more efficiently and more productively and generate innovation um, to get more out of the resources you have, why not? And, you know, if I was here 10 years ago and I was going to tell you that the cost of solar PV, a key technology in renewables, or um, lithium-ion batteries were going to fall by 80%, not 8%, 80%. This is a crowd that knows this already, of course, but sometimes our eyebrows are raised. And that they're not actually eye -water going to be eye-wateringly expensive, but they're going to outcompete conventional technologies. You would have laughed at me. And that's happened in a decade. And economists, and indeed technologists, but certainly economists and energy forecasters entirely and you know, without exception, missed out that transition. And the reason they missed it out is they missed out how quickly we're going to deploy these things. And the costs come down as a function of how you deploy them. You learn to do them better. You get economies of scale and production and distribution. And as the costs come down, you have a greater incentive to deploy them. So you have these reinforcing feedbacks that cause a tipping point. And very quickly, if you blink, you've missed it. And that realization is important because actually we're trapped in what game theorists call strategic complementarities, which is the, the perceived payoff, uh, your, your likelihood that to invest in clean technology is a function of what you think everybody else is going to do, because the payoff from doing that is a function. If everybody else is going to invest, the costs will come down, the finance will go from niche to mainstream, and you'll have new opportunities. If they don't invest, you're taking a risk. You might be kind of you know, an, a first mover that gets, your, you know, gets burnt. 
Um, so if you think everybody else is going to do it, you do it. But the very act of doing it is what brings the cost down. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So we are now at a major tipping point where the world in the next 10, 20, 30 years, and certainly So it's your view that early action from an economic perspective is a story of opportunity. If Asher was Pope, <laughs> it, I'll shout really loudly. I mean, it, it's oh. Oh. <laughs> that, was like, had, that was inevitable that that would happen, wasn't it? Um, you know, there are still risks, okay, but the important thing to notice, and this is, you know, changing the landscape of finance, is that the perception of risk and the landscape of risk has radically changed, yeah. right? Whereas the kind of the newfangled green stuff was seen as risky, now people understand that locking into high-carbon resource-intensive assets, um, not just physical assets, but skills, ideas, and knowledge, is likely to leave those assets stranded and redundant within kind yeah. of a very short period of time. And that is more risky than taking advantage of the potential opportunities of cleaning the economy. Thank you very much. Um, I should say, everybody, we're going to be wildly ambitious in this conversation and throw it open for questions very shortly. So if you've got any questions for our wonderful panellists, and this is an extraordinary setup for like a little owl moving my head like this. Um, but just to put you on notice, if you have any questions as you hear our brilliant panellists share their views, then get ready. So... Quite positive then, more opportunity from the economic perspective if you take early action. Danny, the same question to you, but with the lens now of global society. So when we're looking at this imperative for deep systems transformation at a societal level, sacrifice or opportunity? Thanks, Sally. A super question. The obvious answer is both. Um, you know, we're at Oxfam, we're a global organization, we work on sustainable development, we work in some of the parts of the planet which are already being devastated by climate breakdown. You know, in East Africa, we're seeing droughts, in the Middle East, we're seeing chronic water shortages. My last meeting before I got on the sleeper train in, from Glasgow to here last night was with Mohammed Nasheed, who some of you will remember was the president of the Maldives 10 years ago, and he held the underwater cabinet meeting to talk about what the impacts of climate change on, on the Maldives. And it was heartbreaking to hear from him what's happened over the last 10 years since I first met him. Uh, the reefs around the atolls that in, in the Maldives are already being bleached. Uh, the erosion, because they were protecting from waves, is already uh, devastating the islands. Fish stocks are depleting. So for us, the impacts of, of climate change are real and they're devastating in many parts of the world, but they're being caused by people who live far from the Maldives or from Kenya or from Iraq. You know, according to our research, 92% of the excess emissions caused over the last 25 years were generated in, in rich countries. And so there has to be sacrifice. Those of us who uh, live in countries like this have eaten too much. And we have to change our lifestyles very dramatically. Um, and we have a, Oxfam has a report out today, actually, which shows that the richest 10% of us on the planet, and I suspect that's almost all of us in this room, are still projected to be, uh, to be generating nine times our fair share of emissions if we're going to have any chance of reaching a 1.5 degree planet. So that means each of us has to think about how we are going to reduce our car you know, per capita carbon emission by nine times or ninefold. I think that's a serious sacrifice. But I do think there's opportunity because what, what I get really excited about conversations on green tech is this opportunity to leapfrog, to build a much more inclusive global economy. And so if the opportunity for me is, is you know, if, if green tech can be inclusive tech, and drive social inclusion, not just within each of the communities we live, but at a global level, then I think we can not only build a far more sustainable world, but a far a fairer world. And I think that's the opportunity that's in our grasp and in the grasp of all of you who are pioneers in this sector. Thank you for that. And you raise what I think has been quite a distinct shift over even 18 months, which is the focus on climate justice, the focus on social equity, has come into much sharper relief. And I love that vision of an inclusive economy you know, powered by green tech. If you had a magic wand 
and you could make one thing happen to accelerate that transition to that inclusive economy, what's the one thing you'd really want to see happen? So I'm really excited to be here, but maybe the one thing for this audience, for us as a community, is I would love for us to be flown by hydrogen-powered planes uh, to Nairobi or to Lagos and to have this conversation with the wonderful, amazing entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs that I, I sometimes meet in my day job, and to have a joined up conversation about how we marry their ideas with your ideas, with some of the capital that exists in places like this, and fast track that, the, the, that inclusive element of, of green tech. I think we need to do that really quickly. Yeah. There's no shortage of amazing ideas and amazing entrepreneurs in those, in, in those parts of the world. Thank you very much for Danny. Um, so, Dale, did you get that? We're off to Lagos next. Um, on a hydrogen plane. Oh, slow boat, actually. Um, but Danny, you talked about the need for us all in the privileged West. We are incredibly privileged that you know we might need to make some personal sacrifices. Um, and so I'd like now to move to Rachel, if I may. And the same question, but from the lens of an organization and from the lens of us as individuals. So again, to make this transition, what does that mean at an organizational level? Um, so I assume you're going to speak with the, your Rolls Royce perspective here, but then at a personal level. Uh, great question. Uh, firstly, I think maybe we might beat you on the zero emissions flight pace. <gasps> um, Competition! <laughs> but I think... <laughs> no, I think we all face choice, actually. I think choice is the word I would choose between sacrifice or opportunity. I think, as we've heard, people around the world are already sacrificing for us. So as an organisation, I think we will face tough choices over the next few years as we look to accelerate our decarbonisation and the decarbonisation of power. We are a society that's addicted to power, um, and we need to find a way to make that compatible with net zero. And I think at an individual level, we all have choices to make, whether we choose a plant-based diet or meat-based diet, or whether we choose to get on a, on a flight to Glasgow or a train to Glasgow. Um, so I think choice is the, the word of the day for me. Great. And just picking up that choice and sacrifice and opportunity, where are you in terms of there was a narrative which is, you know, it, making this transition, everybody could win. Do we still think that that's the case? I think everybody has to win. As a society, we have to get to a point where we have a just transition to a low-carbon future. And for that, that means inclusivity. It means power that is dis fairly distributed around mm. the world and is compatible with net zero. So I think if we have to start thinking about it as a collective responsibility, yeah. that we all have to win. Yeah, absolutely. All ships rising. But actually, Dimitri, mm. I'm rather um, cheekily going to bring you back in because one of the conversations I hear quite a lot when we think about the economics of this transition and I was mentioning to Danny earlier, I was at a, a dinner uh, in Glasgow where it was just so depressing because the need for economic transition was being articulated, but no one mentioned the word transformation or different operating model. It was very much um, kind of incrementally shifting the existing system because, and I, ex I expressed my kind of like, oh, really? Um, and uh, a very senior executive from an organisation who won't be mentioned said, well, of course it's going to be like that because we have to make profit all the time and we are solely accountable to our shareholders. And you know, if we say to our shareholders, we're going to take a dip in earnings ratio over the next 18 months to get to that transition, they won't buy it. So, Dimitri, when faced with that, it might cost us more money, we might have to take a hit to our earnings ratio, what do you say? Yeah, I mean, you're taking a risk, right? Do you want to be... <laughs> we, we're going to get we're going to get cheaper electricity, and we're get we're going to get better performance, cheaper cars, and probably cheaper airplanes, and cheaper all sorts of other things eventually because of this transition, right? Um, whether you care two hoots about climate change, we'll have moved from one equilibrium to another. That's not a marginal shift; it's a systemic transformation across technologies. So all businesses have to be aware that if they don't move fast to manage that transition, and if they don't have a viable, forward-looking business strategy that says we will be in business in a low carbon world with technologies that undercut us, with hostile policies, 
then shareholders increasingly will want to know about it. And that's what the whole disclosure and stress testing story is about. And, and that's not just you know, for the sort of new economy evangelists. Even if you're a steel and cement producer, it will probably be in your interest to be best in class in terms of efficiency. We're going to need steel and cement for the next few decades, right? But the successful companies will be the ones that are best able to cope in a uh, low carbon resource efficient world. So it, cu it touches every single sector and certainly all the financial services exposed to that transition. So everyone's going to be touched. And so does that imply that for all of us having those conversations with senior decision makers, yes, it might be possible and plausible to take a slight dip in your quarterly earnings, but that is in pursuit of long-term success. And we have to up our risk appetite to make this happen because it's going to happen anyway. Yeah, look, all businesses have to make choices. They have to make investment choices. Investment choices in, you know, offices and factories, but also investment choices in skills and ideas. And you have to think which choices are likely to be more compatible with the changes we're going to see in the coming century. Uh, and if you don't make the right choices, you're taking undue risk. It's as simple as that, and your shareholders will reward you, and your, your, your you know, lenders uh, will assess you accordingly. I just, I just I hope we don't forget the R word, which is regulation. And one of the reasons I was disappointed about what I heard in Glasgow is we heard, we heard not just millions, billions, we heard trillions that are going to be deployed in voluntary and vague mechanisms. Mm. And the best way to drive behavior change, or an important way, is to have much yeah. more effective yeah. regulation that, that compels businesses and investors. Policy is crucial. Yeah. That policy is what instills credibility and sends a signal to investors. You know, look, sorry, to, but I mean, look, we're talking about energy, we're talking about transport, we're talking about land use, we're talking about cities and buildings. These are the most highly regulated policy driven sectors in, on the planet. Uh, and if policymakers aren't sending the right signals to give investors the confidence to invest in uh, a clean transition, they're going to wait. And one thing we don't have time for is waiting. Yeah, I would agree. In the forum, we are really encouraging all of our private sector po partners to find their voice and actually make it really clear what they need from policymakers. Um, particularly when you're thinking about it is trillions that need to be invested. One of the draw one of the things that's holding people back is that sort of lack of clarity of the policy environment so all of you in business find your advocacy voice make it clear what regulation you need anyway i just wanted to bring you in because it, it, that's kind of a bit of a tortuous argument that's happening at the moment i think we need to step over that and say come on let's just invest into the new economy but i'm going to go back now if i may to the individual and organisational perspective. And um, Pierre, thank you for waiting so patiently. I was always going to get to you, don't worry. Um, but again, at um, an organisational level, um, and perhaps at a personal level, tell us more about this notion of sacrifice or opportunity. But I think you've got a very specific lens of plastics, which we've heard about already, a credit card's worth of ingestion of the material on a weekly basis. That's quite scary. Um, so a really good impetus to think about switching from plastics. But can you give your perspective on this question from that organizational personal point of view, but with the lens of plastic? Yeah, so uh, for context, uh, uh, I'm the co-founder of NotPla, we're a sustainable, uh, sustainable packaging startup developing alternatives to single-use plastics using, sea using seaweed and plants. Um, and basically, like, it's not going to replace all of the plastic, but definitely there's a bunch of like plastic things that we use for five minutes that don't really deserve to be plastic and that could be made of, of seaweed. And I think, first of all, it's um, super interesting what we were hearing about like the, the cost, the earnings, the kind of like uh, focus that we have on, 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 uh, on money. Because the real cost um, like, is so much higher than the price on the market. We all know that, but like we're laying to ourselves that like, that doesn't matter. And I think just accepting that uh, when we put things out there, we're putting a cost for the rest of the society to bear and we are kind of like excluding it from the equation is fundamentally what kind of like stops us from doing the right choices. The very lowest estimates on the real cost of plastic on society is that it, it's at least 10 times the market price of the material for loss of ecosystem, health implications, so when we choose plastic, yes, it's cheap in the short run because it's heavily subsidized, but like really we're just kind of like taking from everyone's kind of like collective pot. So regulations, of course, are, are important, but like even at a corporation level, um, do we continue to lie to ourselves that like we're just kind of like able to 
continue making a profit when we know that what we're putting out there is just going to cost us all of uh, all of, of this uh, amount of, of money and, and kind of like services that are lost. So I think that um, one of the things is like accepting slowly to kind of like reintegrate the real price of things. And it's the same for carbon, it's the same for soil, but like finding a way to kind of like just account correctly for what we are really doing because this extractive model is just kind of like always going to be uh, uh, embedded with with this this flood and so I think that like that's one of the things that is really hard to see but I think that um, even from a voluntary perspective a lot of people are willing to kind of like pick the better solution that really takes into account all of its uh, full cost so I think that gives a lot of hope and also it gives a lot of opportunities because all of a sudden there's a bunch of solutions that are really much cheaper than plastic and carbon intense uh, like uh, uh, like solutions and so on because they are actually kind of like fully accounted for. And I think that like that shows how um, these things are gonna be more competitive in the long run. And actually like I'm quite hopeful there's so much money flowing into kind of like uh, like startups and, and innovators from the private kind of like equity uh, side of things because these people have also kind of like understood that this is where the future lies. And I think the problem is that the old shareholders and the kind of like slightly slower kind of like investors are really reluctant to follow this path. But I think that there's, there's a lot of hope because yeah, we're building things that are uh, going to be fully transparent that really kind of like explain what happens from like the beginning to the end. Um, and, and it's an amazing opportunity. And Nokla then, your organization, what's the product that you're most excited about? Um, so uh, we actually like I mean, it's interesting we were talking about like specific like application specific solutions and we actually want to develop a range of different products that are looking at very specific consumption cycles so we're not going to have one thing that just replaces everything but we're kind of like really excited a bit you look at like fruits and vegetables like trees every single fruit is kind of distinct from the, each other because they exist in a different climate and a different kind of like area in the world and so on so we have to have this kind of like level of detail okay. um, and the problem of plastic is that it's allowed us to be super lazy and design the same thing for everything in the world and that's like what need, that's the sacrifice we have to stop designing things because we just can do it like quickly and cheaply and like the responsibility is to put in the hands of consumers something that is really kind of like appropriate for uh, the, the application so uh, our first product is like little bubble that we use for marathons. You can like get hydration, it contains water. It's literally edible, so you can eat it. But like you don't, it does, it's not like plastic. <laughs> it's gonna be horrible for you. It's actually edible, um, and uh, we're also doing like takeaway boxes where the coating on the cardboard is made from seaweed, um, and it's coming in the UK at the moment. So uh, really exciting stuff. It's not gonna replace all the plastic, but definitely for quick consumption cycles, uh, we have to stop using plastic because it's gonna be around forever. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I have to get off my perch. Does anybody feel brave enough, excited enough to ask a question to any of our panellists? Oh, hello. Let's, can we get you a microphone just because then, please. I have, a, I have a carbon question. We talked about just transition, talk about opportunity. So carbon is about stocks and flows, as we all know. So currently, in terms of flows, the per capita carbon footprint, let's say of India, is about 1.9 tons. Of the United States, is about 16 tons. So it's about eight times. But if you take the stocks, the United States has put into the atmosphere 351 gigatons. India has put about 50 gigatons, historically. And taken the population ratio, it's actually 28 times. So how do you get to the politicians in countries like India and hundreds of such countries around the world that you really need to do better? It's a very tough question, but I hope we, we have answers to that. Thank you. It is a really tough and brilliant question. Who'd like to have a stab at that? Well, Dimitri looks as though he's gay. <laughs> But I, I mean, uh, you're absolutely right. There is no moral case for India to be cutting emissions. I mean, you know, we, we've put this stuff up that we're causing the problems. It's our historical legacy. And now just when India, you know, is looking to industrialize, we're saying, no, you can't. The case that we do have is that India could actually make a lot more uh, of the opportunities and profits in the fastest growing market in the world if it decarbonizes. Because as Danny says, the best way to drive innovation uh, and to get entrepreneurs to actually deliver the you know, technologies and behaviors of the future 
is through regulation and other policies to send that signal. And I think that's why India should do it. And at the same time, by the way, maybe it doesn't want quite as polluted particulates in cities, and maybe it wants better transport systems and more efficient energy and da-da-da-da. So it, it's the talk of opportunity. But, and this is the just transition, disruption is disruptive. There will be winners and losers, and we really have to be aware that those losers have to be brought on board. Um, either by compensation or better still by retooling them and reskilling them and allowing you know, those who will lose out of the transition to benefit from the opportunities of the new economy. And that's not going to be easy politics, um, but we can't shy away from it. I would agree. Danny, anything to uh, add? Yeah, I think the link, link is climate finance. Yeah. It is uh, unacceptable, morally reprehensible, that rich countries promised a dozen years ago that they would be delivering $100 billion Absolutely. in climate finance and they not even haven't made it now. They're not even going to make it for the next three years. And we need a lot more than 100 billion. And I think we, as citizens, uh, need to put pressure on our leaders to live up to eat just the pledges they've already made. And of course, go further than that into questions of loss and damage. Because I think we have to recognize that the, the people who are suffering already, who are going to be affected the worst, who are most vulnerable to climate breakdown, had the least to do with the world that they're living in. And that we have, you know, climate justice has to be part, front and center in some ways, of climate action. And I, I think that's absolutely right. And when you think about climate finance, Danny, then, have you seen any meaningful shift in the willingness to begin to deliver on some of those promises or, or not quite yet? Uh, yes, so Nicola Sturgeon on Monday uh, made a, a very small but significant announcement. She said the Scottish government would pledge a million dollars towards a loss and damage fund. It's a million dollars. It's not very much, but she becomes the first government in the world to recognise that Scotland has a historical obligation to pay for the loss and damage that's being wrought on the, uh, around the world. And I think that's the sort of leadership we yep. need more of. And technology. Yeah. OK, great. We've got uh, no time left, um, which is... A shame, because we could continue this conversation. So just to round us off, um, I'd like to ask you all in turn, I'll start with you, Pierre, so you have the least amount of time to think about this. Um, for all of these wonderful people in our audience, um, all of whom are really wanting to be part of this transformation, otherwise you're in the wrong place, by the way, um, what would your advice be for all of these willing change makers in the audience? One piece of advice that they could take away and realize in their change-making journeys. It can't be by your product. Um, I think <coughs> we all work for organizations or um, <coughs> governments or whatever it is, and but we're a human being, uh, first of all. And so I think that um, we have to kind of like disconnect the, the two and like put pressure on whoever we are working with or uh, within or wherever for the human being that we are. Yeah. Like sometimes it's too easy to get kind of like given a, a job and like a, a, like a scope and you have to just kind of like get on with it, but we can challenge that and we can actually ask for more accountability from like the bigger organization we're part of as a human. Yeah, so bring your personal value set to bear into your professional life. Very good, excellent. Rachel. Um, yeah, I'm gonna say, because this is the Green Tech Festival, I'm gonna say I think embrace the technology transition that's coming. Um, I think all of us in the room are in a privileged position where we can take the risks that we've been talking about. Um, so let's jump in. Great, Danny? Uh, make green tech cool. You know, for many of us who've been in this debate, this has been seen traditionally as sort of dull and earnest. But, you know, I, I really want my credit card to be made for sea of seaweed because I'd eat a lot more. Or, you know, we have 600 shops in the UK at Oxfam and where we collect something like 12,000 tonnes of, of, of recycled clothing. But what's happened in the last couple of years, it, second-hand clothing has become really cool. If you saw Emma Watson at the Earthshot Prize, yes. she was wearing a, a recycled dress made of 10 Oxfam wedding dress or wedding dresses donated to Oxfam. That's the sort of cultural revolution that you guys can help drive and we need to drive very very cool very quickly yeah unleash your inner coolness dimitri so i agree with absolutely everything that's been said including including buying pierre's products of course um but um you know just to add to that i mean on top of obviously embracing the transition understanding the changing balance of risk i would just add so as not to repeat um, make your voices heard to governments. Governments need to hear that businesses want to be regulated and want to be steered in this direction. Because if they don't, they will lose 
a competitive advantage to those other countries that are ahead of the game. So governments need to be ahead of the game too. And they hear, um, governments will hear and will be lobbied by the incumbents who lose from this. But the potential new you know, um, industries and sectors, and very often they're potential, they don't exist or they haven't scaled up yet, they need to make their voices heard as a counter lobby in order to shift government policy and start this virtuous transition to cleaning up. Great, thank you all very much. So returning to the question that we were considering, does sustainability mean sacrifice? I would like to suggest that yes, it does to an extractive economy that's not geared to the objectives of a sustainable development, but it means complete opportunity for a regenerative economy, one that works for people and for the planet. And let's make that shift extractive to regenerative. Thank you all very much. You've been amazing. Give them a round of applause. Thank you.